It's the World This Week, the World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Joining us from Beirut, journalist uh, Rania Abu Zaid. Uh, how are you doing, Rania? How's your week been? What to say? What a week. <laughs> uh, it's been a very difficult week in the Middle East. It would be hard to overstate, actually, the depths of emotions uh, across the region of anger and despair and grief and sadness at the images that are coming out of Gaza. So a very difficult week. Very difficult week. And we'll be talking about it in a moment with, uh, as well, Lila Jacinto, senior editor at uh, France24.com. How are you faring? Another difficult week. Yes. Uh, but it seems, uh, you know, in terms of the amount of work, we're settling into a second week, but just as disturbing. Well, the, th the fourth one is actually coming up now. Uh, with us, Jose, as well, Josef Devec, columnist at uh, International Politique Quarterly. How are you doing? Okay. But Able to take a step back? Um, I don't know if we have time for, for this, but, but yes, I think it's one of the first times, at least in my younger life, that where I think being plugged in into the news cycle 24-7 is something you don't necessarily want to do. Right. Uh, we have another recovering uh, news junkie with us, Marius uh, Shatner, uh, former Jerusalem correspondent for the French news agency AFP, co-author in French of The Kippur War Will Not Take Place. Uh, the, the the War of 1973, of and, course. And it took place. And it, of course it did take place. Uh, uh, thanks for being with us. How's your week been? Uh, my week is in Paris, so it was quiet, but uh, sad, intense, yeah. sad. By the way, you can listen, like, and subscribe to The World This Week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other streaming services. There was this rare ray of hope amidst three weeks of hell. Hamas, in a deal brokered by Qatar in the U.S., releasing two elderly hostages. Even there, though, there was strife. Some Israelis objecting to the image of 85-year-old Yosheved Lifshitz shaking the hand of one of her captors. Uh, they liked it even less when the lifelong kibbutz resident blasted Israel's security lapses at a press conference uh, 12 hours later. She was speaking at the hospital. She was recovering in Tel Aviv. That said, she also provided a trove of information about the enemy. We started walking in the tunnels where the earth was moist and always humid. We reached a hall where we were gathered, some 25 people. After two or three hours, they separated five from my kibbutz and placed them in a different room. We had guards and a paramedic with us. A doctor also came and he made sure that we were given some medicine. The latest figure of those hostages, Marius Shatner, is 229, according to Israel. We're not quite sure. If yeah, that not number. quite sure. Uh, but uh, listening to her, two takeaways, obviously, there. First of all, those tunnels are deep if it was humid. Yeah. And secondly, the, they're, they're careful about how they treat the hostages. So this is, what does this tell you about the October 7th attack? No, it has, uh, it, it, you know, when you take hostages, it is, it is precious for you. It's a monnaie de chance, we say in French. Uh, you want to change them, so it's important to preserve them. Uh, but it has nothing, it's not a moral issue. It's a, uh, it's, and very often, in many situations of hostages, hostages don't complain. You have this f about uh, uh, the fact that they were taken. Uh, it's, it's classic, it doesn't say nothing about, uh, she was released, but you have children, four years old, little children, who are still uh, hostages. It's something incredible. And right now there are negotiations still ongoing, perhaps explained as one of the reasons why there hasn't been this big ground offensive that's been uh, talked it about. It is possible, but there is another reason, which is simpler which means it's very difficult to make such a big uh, offensive. It's very, uh, we have the example of Mosul, uh, when uh, the, it took months for, for troops to, uh, to occupy or to, 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 to get uh, away the people of the, the, sol the fighters of Daesh. And, and uh, you have this underground Gaza, which is uh, a trap. So the Israeli army is, uh, or the Israeli people are not 
in a, very motivated to do there. There was a last poll, a very interesting poll, if, if I may uh, uh, tell uh, two, two weeks ago, the poll was saying that a great majority of Israelis were in favor of a very large operation uh, on land. land on, on, on. Today is the contrary. We have a lot of Israelis, they don't say that they're against it, but they say wait. Yeah, 49% saying wait, and those numbers are up dramatically when you compare it to three weeks ago, Leela Jacinto. Yeah, I mean, we're all asking uh, why this massive ground invasion that was promised is not happening. The New York Times actually did a piece. Uh, apparently, there are splits, according to the New York Times sources, between the uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's war cabinet and the military. Apparently, the military is ready to go, uh, but the war cabinet is not signing off on it. Uh, Netanyahu is actually being careful, and uh, this was tie in with what you said. Uh, he's very unpopular. He's unstable. You know, the other the other hypothesis is that, uh, you know, the U.S. Is, uh, is putting up a defense shield and has asked uh, Israel to hold off on a ground offensive. Or indeed, we are not going to have this major ground offensive. Are they looking at small incursions uh, like they've been having uh, over the past 48 hours? Because the central question that every Everybody asked pretty soon after October 7th was like, what is the end game? Uh, and I think the Israelis, after the emotion of uh, October 7th, uh, uh, in terms of an end game for the ground offensive, which would be you know, a game changer. What they are really doing is standard business practice in Gaza, which is just bombing the civilians. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, the international community's uh, outrage is, is, is also isolating Israel. So all this is playing into why this ground invasion has not yet begun. Yeah, there's nowhere to run in a Gaza Strip under blockade. Uh, we've seen heavy barrages in both directions this Friday evening. The Queen of Jordan, born to Palestinian parents, calling out earlier in the week on CNN what she sees as a double standard. I think the people all around uh, the Middle East, including in Jordan, we are just shocked and disappointed by the world's reaction to this catastrophe that is unfolding. In the last couple of weeks, we have seen you know, a glaring double standard uh, in the world. When October 7th happened, the world immediately and unequivocally uh, stood by Israel and uh, its right to defend itself and condemned uh, the attacks that happened. But when we, what we're seeing the last couple of weeks, we have, we're seeing silence in the world. Um, you know, uh, countries have stopped at just expressing concern or acknowledging the casualties, but always with a preface of declaration of support uh, for Israel. And, uh, you know, are we being told... Yeah, that interview uh, getting a lot of traction, uh, Rania Abu Zaid, and uh, there's the sense that time is, on, is not on the side of either the Israelis or the Palestinians. Well, Queen Rania of Jordan very clearly vocalized what is the predominant sentiment across the region. This feeling that, as she put it, she asked the question, do Palestinian lives matter less than other lives? She uh, pointed to what many are calling double standards in terms of how uh, American and European officials are referring to Palestinian casualties, more than 7,000 of them. More than 3,000 of those are children and Israeli casualties. So the double speak and the double span, uh, standards have been laid bare now for all to see. And it is extremely significant that Queen Rania and her husband, King Abdullah, have been so blunt in their criticism of uh, the Gaza war. King Abdullah called Israel's actions war crimes. And it is significant because the Jordanian royals are perhaps the most pro-Western leaders in the Arab world. And for them to be showing this frustration, this anger, uh, is, uh, is no small matter. And Rania, uh, as we speak, uh, the uh, Israeli military stating that uh, its ground forces are expanding operations and calling on residents of Gaza City to move uh, further south. It's not the first time in the last three weeks that the Israeli military has told civilians to evacuate areas. 
evacuate and go where? They are trapped inside what international and Israeli human rights organizations have called the world's largest open-air prison. It's a very small, very densely populated area. And the death toll indicates the ferocity of the bombing campaign. So where are these people supposed to go? Let me ask you about this, Joseph Devek, because this, this talk about double standards, a Palestinian life not mattering as much as an Israeli life. We heard the French president, Emmanuel Macron, uh, on his trip to the Middle East, sort of using, employing those exact words and saying, yes, they do matter as much. Uh, the uh, Arab world's public opinion is certainly leaving its mark. It certainly left its mark, it seems, on the EU summit that's just concluded. Yes, I think uh, Emmanuel Macron is trying to strike a balance. Uh, if we look at sort of the press conference he has given uh, just uh, after the European Council, um, he's trying to emphasize that, um, that Israel has the right to protect itself, but um, in its right to protect itself, it needs to abide to humanitarian law. And he seems to suggest, and I thought this was kind of new in this press conference, that a massive ground operation wouldn't be really in within this uh, within this context uh, uh, would be okay. That is a sort of new position. It's a position that is not entirely shared by Europeans. Well, let me let, let's listen to Emmanuel Macron because he this is what he said uh, at the tail end of a trip that began in Israel and then took him to the West Bank, to uh, uh, Jordan and Egypt. This is what he said in the tarmac in Cairo before uh, coming back for that EU summit. France recognizes Israel's rights to defend itself and protect its population, but it recognizes it within the framework of the respect of civilian lives. So regarding a ground intervention, if it's entirely targeted against terrorist groups, that is Israel's choice. But if it's a massive operation that would endanger civilian lives, in that case I think it's a mistake. And it's also a mistake for Israel. A mistake for Israel as well. That was Wednesday. You're saying his language is even stronger today? Yeah, I think it is definitely not the language that other Europeans, I'm thinking of Germany in particular, is using. Basically, he's saying that such a ground operation would come with a lot of civilian casualties, and he's also saying that it comes with uncalculable risks. And I think this is true, and this is also part of the hesitancy. We don't know once Israel would launch such an operation, it would be sort of the biggest military operation it has launched in decades. We don't know what the consequences of it are. It might take months. We don't know what the definition of success of it is. And we don't know what it would lead to in other theaters of war, in the north, in, uh, in the Golan Heights in Israel. It could have repercussions to other regions. And I think what Macron is trying to do is to prevent this, and his stance here is that thus Israel shouldn't launch a massive ground operation. Marius Shatner, did Macron succeed in striking the balance that Joseph no, Devec no, talked about? No, he did not succeed because it's impossible to succeed. Mm. If you say Israeli has the right to defend itself uh, and to kill only uh, what we call terrorists because it was a terrorist action, of course every military operation will cost a lot of life to civilian Palestinian civilians. You kill a lot of people with planes, you don't need soldiers. Sometimes you kill less people by a, by a ground operation than by an indiscriminate bombing. But I want to say something that I say rarely all the time hearing about the double standard. I come from Israel, where all the times the Israeli complain on the double standard from the Israeli media. Uh, uh, I don't want to uh, say that it, uh, the life of Palestinians count more for them for a lot of reasons, not only humanitarian, but strategic, strategic reason, than the life of Jews, of Israelis. I think the discussion on double standards doesn't bring us very far. The problem is not, maybe there is a double standard, I don't deny But let, let's it. get back then in that case to what, what Emmanuel Macron was saying. How do you try to strike a balance? Because that's his job as president you, you, of France. You, you, he's got Europe's largest Jewish and Muslim population. Yes, yes, but you... And could, he's got hostages, if, and he's got uh, Palis, French Palestinians who are stuck in Gaza right yes, now. Yes, but if, if, if you strike, you kill civilians in this concentration. Also because, how was he explained, uh, Gaza is a great... Uh, Great prison. Uh, it would be a great prison even if there is not occupation by Israel of the West Bank. 
but uh, uh, there will be uh, civilian, uh, yes, a lot of civilians killed. I don't know if the numbers given by Hamas are true. They may be exaggerated, but it's certainly true that you have thousands of people who die. But the problem is not this. You said very truly that there is no end game in the Israeli strategy. What is the end game of Hamas? What, what? The problem is that if people speak of peace, peace between whom? Likud, the Israeli right in power, and Hamas, whose far objective, and maybe not so far, is the destruction of Israel. About what they will discuss. About, they can discuss about ceasefire for X time, but uh, I don't see an issue in this situation. If you're Israel, who do you talk with? Look, the one thing about Hamas's trip, uh, I mean Macron's trip, sorry, uh, to the region that we haven't talked about is his statement about extending uh, the coalition against Daesh to Hamas. Which he dialed back. Which he dialed back, Twilight. but which was incredibly controversial. And this ties in, this ties in with Hamas, because you had Turkey's president Erdogan saying that, you know, Hamas is a nationalist group. You cannot, it is a terrorist group, and we have all sorts of mechanisms to handle terrorist group, terrorist financing, etc. But you cannot equate a, 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 a nationalist group with a nihilistic uh, Islamist group uh, like Daesh and Al-Qaeda. That was one. And two, to the uh, to, the, to the point of who takes over Gaza if there is a ground offensive. I mean, let's not forget that it was the Israelis that undermined the Palestinian Authority. Yes, and now, you know, and Hamas... All, all that is true. We've, talk, we've, we've <laughs> talked about this nightly, Leela Jacinto. This is, this but going forward, we, if we want to spare lives, who do the Israelis negotiate with? Well, first and foremost, in order to start a negotiation, you need a ceasefire. I mean, in terms of negotiations, there are negotiations going on about hostages, and Qatar is involved in it. The noises coming out of Iran are cert certainly one. I mean, Iran, I'm not backing Tehran as a player, but the noises are certainly one of engaging in a, in a discourse. Because all the countries in the region, and Rania knows this probably better than all of us because she feels it, this is going to be such an escalation. We've got an enormous U.S. military buildup in the region. Two, uh, you know, two U.S. Uh, warships. Uh, we've got squadrons of F-16 fighter jets. You can't talk about de-escalating and then have a U.S. military troop buildup. So in order to, to uh, and Macron talked about, you know, restarting the peace process. I mean, I mean, one of the things about how terrible the October 7th uh, attack was, uh, was to be able to restart it. Rani Abu Zaid, lots to unpack there. Let's begin with the role of Qatar and who Israel negotiates with. Well, Qatar has been involved, as your guest uh, said, in a very intense mediation process to try and release some of those Israeli hostages. And it has succeeded, uh, you know, a few times. Um, by all accounts, those uh, discussions are progressing rapidly. So we'll wait and see what happens uh, from Qatar. But uh, in terms of uh, Macron's comments about expanding this anti-ISIS front, they were um, not terribly well received here in the region, given that, I mean, what is he talking about in terms of expanding an anti-ISIS front that in Iraq was spearheaded by the Iraqi army and by pro-Iranian Iraqi groups that uh, took on uh, Daesh in Iraq? So, you know, many people were left uh, scratching their heads here trying to understand what he meant by that. But certainly the fears of this Gaza war exploding into a, a regional conflict are very real and they are very scary. And all indications are that, you know, all the various players are preparing for that potential eventuality. Well, let's unpack that. First off, it's a, sometimes it seems like a question of uh, uh, each side reigning in their own. Before October the 7th, the tensions uh, in the West Bank, where the far-right government of Benjamin Netanyahu was actively orchestrating the displacement of Palestinians by Jewish settlers was the focus. That process has actually accelerated since. They found refuge with the hundreds in the village. chased from their land by massed settlers aided by army soldiers. Absolutely. The settlers arrived. They shot into the air. They said, if you don't leave, we will shoot you down. The Israeli soldiers didn't help us. 
Rather, they were with the settlers and threatened us. Uh, that's even drawn a rebuke from Washington. I continue to be alarmed about extremist settlers attacking Palestinians in the West Bank, that uh, pouring gasoline on fire is what it's like. They, this was a deal. The deal was made, and they're attacking Palestinians in places that they're entitled to be. It has to stop. Rania Abu Zaid, we, we, again, uh, you heard earlier uh, Marius Shatner describing what the mood was like three weeks ago compared to today. Three weeks ago when the U.S. said, we're sending our warships, the whole world interpreted it as the U.S. is going all in. Now when you hear Joe Biden say, saying you're throwing fuel on the fire, what is the U.S. strategy here? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> But what are your thoughts listening to Joe Biden there? Well, I mean, you know, Joe Biden has uh, has talked about the settlements as if they uh, emerged yesterday. Uh, the Times of Israel, no friend to the Palestinian cause, said that 2023 set an all time record for settlement expansion. Uh, a reminder that settlements in occupied territory are illegal under international law. So it is, you know, welcome that he is recognizing uh, something which is illegal under international law. But this is, there is so much to unpack when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this is the, the context that the UN Security General raised in his, in his speech, which he was blasted for. But that is the fact that this is a very long, very protracted conflict. And there are a lot of different factors that need to be discussed if there is to be any sort of resolution to this very dire, very dangerous, very uh, sad conflict that has already, in this latest round, claimed the lives of thousands of people on both sides. We talked about reasons why Israel hasn't gone in, and there were other reports, uh, Josef Devek, that suggested that it's the United States uh, trying to rein in the Israelis because they don't have a plan for, quote, the day after, for what happens next. We even heard Joe Biden own up to the mistakes the United States has made in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yes, I think it's true. I mean, uh, there is no plan for this. There is no plan for the day after. And you don't know, once you go in there, what the consequences of this are. And Biden was in his speech quite clear that he's saying I've, he thought that the U.S. did some mistakes after 9-11 and that he hoped that Israel wouldn't do similar mistakes. And I think Israel needs time also to, 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 to know what it really wants. You were mentioning the change in polls. Yes. And then there is the question of hostages. There's the pressure, certainly from Europeans and other countries, who really just want this conflict not to escalate. Europeans don't want a regionalization. OK, so, so the, the panel's given mixed reviews to Emmanuel Macron. How about Joe Biden, Marius Shatner? Joe Biden, it depends. Uh, the time of Israel is not so anti-Palestinian. <laughs> How your uh, journalist said it, it's quite very critical about the politic of, uh, of um, uh, Netanyahu. By the way, it's true that uh, settlement activity accelerated in the last uh, year, two years. And also what is true that in the West Bank, you had uh, a, a very strong, uh, very uh, bloody Israeli repression in the last month. The, the, the number of Palestinians killed, not all are civilian, a lot of fighters, terrorists, depends how you call them, but climbed uh, very strongly. The, also, there was... Uh, so now you have this unity, this emergency government. Can't the likes of Benny Gantz say to the, to the far right, look, stop it with expelling Palestinians? This is not the time... It's not begin. exactly a unity government. It's a government of, of Netanyahu with, who brought people like Gantz who have a military experience which lacked uh, uh, to other minister of the government. It's not, it's not exactly unity. I want to stress also something uh, f from the Israeli view. The Israeli population will not accept to come back on the situation ante. People who live uh, on the, near the Gaza Strip and people also who live, who live on the north uh, frontier uh, will not accept to come back to their 
villages under the threat uh, of a new attack. So, so we, are, we are in an impossible situation. We have really, nobody has a plan how to solve. But there is a possibility of a truce, of course, during which hostage it may be released also, which will bring food, water, electricity, not petrol, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the population of Gaza. But the problem is more than this. Where are we going? And how Israeli and Palestinian under this direction can come to a kind of peace? How, for instance, there is the, 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 uh, there was, you have two ideas of peace. You had the idea of two states. Now, the idea of two states was killed by the, by, by, by the, settle, by the settlements. You have now 600,000 uh, Israeli who live in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Let's say not 600,000 had to be, will be removed, but even 200,000 or 150,000. I don't see the Israeli society accept it. Uh, they, don't, they will not accept also a, now to see a Palestinian... But will they accept ignoring going back to basically thinking, well, we can talk over the heads of the Palestinians, make deals to normalize relations. That's a, that's, that's a pure, that was a pure illusion. Can, that was, what... It was broken. But mm. May I say, what happened with this horrible operation is brought back the Palestinian in front of the Palestinian question, but he didn't give the answer. You have the problem and you have not the answer. Well, two things. One is what happened on October 7th was sort of a pushback to the Abraham's Accord. So, you know, yes. in a way, this, the status quo is what triggered this. We can't have a status quo. Two, I just have to push it, you know, when you ask about Biden and what's the Biden administration's plan, obviously now the spin from Washington is that, you know, we came out very strongly in support with, uh, of Israel. Now we are the only ones who have some sort of the Israel's year, uh, you know, to take credit for the trickle of humanitarian aid that is going in and, you know, taking, uh, taking credit for this ground invasion with no plan are uh, not quite happening. The problem, though, is U.S. credibility as a quote-unquote honest broker, which was never an honest broker, but now is absolutely rock bottom. The problem right now is that we are in 2023, and we are no more the Eurocentric world that we used to be. And it could be, and it could change as well in 2024. Uh, the uh, uh, U.S. president uh, has to contend right now with a Republican-led House of Representatives, whose brand new speaker, elected after much infighting, has his own way of forging policy. Someone asked me today in the media, they said, it's curious, people are curious, what does Mike Johnson think about any issue under the sun? I said, well, go pick up a Bible off your shelf and read it. That's, that's my worldview. That's what I believe. And so I make no... Religious Sento. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, why why do we go off on Islamists? You know, we've got the Bible on the one hand and scriptures that are taken as land deeds. <laughs> Absol absolutely like, I mean, and when you, when you see this is, the, you know, this is the opposition leader, I just cannot help thinking that I really feel that we're coming to the end of seeing U.S. power. Uh, and what we have seen in the past two weeks is this alignment that is getting even stronger uh, on the international stage. Uh, of, of course, the U.S. is the military superpower, but just look, for instance, at the way you, the UAE has joined forces on, in the U.N. Security Council voting with China and Russia. Uh, you know, these alliances are, are really being right, but tested. That's a, the UN's a talk shop. What we saw this Friday was the United States, uh, after last week, hitting back uh, against missiles from Yemen, uh, knocking uh, m militias in eastern Syria, aligned uh, with uh, Iran. Uh, the U.S., which has forces present in Syria and Iraq, is part of that fight against ISIS uh, that we were talking about. Uh, Yosef Devek, are we... Again, are we underestimating or overestimating the United States in all this? I think there's some elements of truth that, that sort of U.S. power is waning, but I think we have to see it in a larger context. We are seeing in reality a sort of challenge to the world order as it existed. And everyone that is sort of extremist, everyone that is revisionist is coming out of the holes and thinks it's time for action now. We think about Azerbaijan who has moved against Armenia. 
Armenia was supposed to be Russia's ally. So it's not only the US, it's also Russia who is a big player, who kind of loses sometimes in this new world where unthinkable things suddenly become real policy options. We see uh, what is happening, you know, the, the Hamas massacre. I think it's probably difficult to think about this without the context of the Russia-Ukraine war, mm. without this idea that Russia just attacked another country and just, yeah, changed sort of the, the ideas of what is thinkable. And this happens in a lot of phases. And it's not only the US that is struggling with. I think this, all of this is going to come by back and not only do that. Yeah, you mentioned Russia. There's the fury in Israel over Hamas's visit to Moscow. Uh, a senior member, his name is Abu Marzouk, uh, posing with Vladimir Putin's uh, Middle East envoy and Iran's deputy foreign minister on Thursday uh, in the Russian capital. Uh, the Russians uh, saying, Marius Shartner, we speak to all sides. The Israelis are furious. Is this... Um, going to mean a new low in Israel-Russia relations? Well, the, 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 this, this relations are not wonderful. That means the, uh, Israeli didn't help um, seriously Ukraine. It's true. But um, Israeli is on the American side. And uh, also the Israeli, at least we can understand. But Israel always we, kept the channels open with yes, Moscow. Yes, they will be open. They will, they will, they will be open. The, the, they will still be open. The Israeli also have uh, about, yes, to stand out. For instance, when Putin speaks about civilian killed, about human rights, it is not, it's, I can say it's taken with a smile by the Israelis uh, when they hear these lessons about human yeah. rights given for Or in Russia, Syria, where Ronnie... Or, 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 or Syria, where you hear in Syria something is close to a genocide, uh, and which is happily is still now not happening. Uh, but do you agree with Yosef that there is this Ukraine effect? There is an international. There is an international game. There is a mixture. You know, every, it's always the. It recalls me the discussion about Hamas. Hamas. I can't. What you say about Daesh? Of course, Hamas is not Daesh. It's, Israeli prime minister tried to, to sell it, but it's true that Hamas used methods like Daesh, killing, cruel killing of which happened in other countries of the world. Nobody speaks about it in Africa and so on also. Uh, but these are typically Daesh methods. But Hamas has a terrorist, uh, a terrorist aspect, but it's not only a terrorist movement. It is also a political movement and an ideology. And it's difficult for people <coughs> to say this and this, the two things together. And to reduce Hamas to Daesh, uh, like also the proposition of the French president, it's illusionary. It's, it's, it's right, one final question before we move on from this chapter, uh, and that has to do with what is Hamas. On Wednesday, Lebanon's Al Manar television putting out a photo <coughs> showing Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah meeting with the head of Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the deputy head of Hamas's political uh, bureau. Uh, we're not sure where the photo was taken, Rani Abu Zaid, uh, but uh, they, they call themselves the axis of resistance. Is Hamas gone from being an offshoot of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood to being an Iranian proxy? It is certainly part of Iran's so-called axis of resistance, which links Tehran to Lebanon's Hezbollah, to Syria's Bashar al-Assad, to some of the pro-Iranian Iraqi groups, to Yemen's Houthis, and also to Hamas. Now, Hamas was part of this axis prior to breaking from it during this, uh, the early years of the Syrian civil war before it rejoined its uh, strategic allies. So uh, Hamas is back in the Iranian fold, if you like, after a number of years of stepping away from it. Point. Uh, the, uh, there is a difference between Hamas and Jihad. The, 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 Islamic jihad, jihad. the Islamic Jihad. The Islamic Jihad had very strong links, to say less, uh, from the beginning with, with Iran. Hamas has more autonomy, more uh, is a more representative political uh, movement. All right. So not 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 quite the same. Uh, uh, Rani Abu Zaid, uh, in, in Beirut, it was the week where uh, Turkey's president voiced fury at the bombing of Gaza and insisted he'd be staying away from Israel anytime soon. 
Uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan and <coughs> 84 million other citizens have a birthday to celebrate this coming Sunday. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk proclaiming the Turkish Republic back in 1923. He changed the alphabet. He instituted the separation of religion and state. Uh, now, the French news agency AFP describes the buildup uh, as low-key. Rania, let, let me ask you, sitting in uh, part of what was once uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, what's the view on this, on this centennial where you are? Well, it's been overshadowed, actually, by the events in Gaza and the fears of a, of a regional war, but it is certainly uh, momentous. It is a momentous occasion. If we look at Ataturk's Turkey and if we look at Erdogan's Turkey, there, you know, we're seeing a, um, a shift in terms of social and religious conservatism <coughs> under Erdogan. But Erdogan, again, as this week's, uh, uh, as his speech indicated, Turkey is once again struggling east and west, trying to find its place between these two uh, parts of the world, these two different uh, areas. And, uh, you know, Erdogan has relations with uh, Turkey, excuse me, has relations with Israel. And yet this week, Erdogan issued a very stern uh, speech against Israeli actions in Gaza. So it's this, this balancing act that uh, has come to define Turkey's role in the region. Yeah, and we saw, Josef Dvek, we saw it this week because on the one hand, blasting Israel. On the other hand, uh, the, the Turkish president uh, saying, okay, parliament can vote now on letting Sweden into NATO. Yeah, he's, the, he's playing different sides. Um, and uh, he's within NATO, uh, but he has other alliances as well. It's, uh, it's a difficult game for him to play. But what I really thought was interesting is sort of this 100-year uh, anniversary is if you look at the beginning of sort of the Ataturk project, there was this idea of modernization. And also in policy terms, in political terms, but also in economic terms. And if you look at it today... And that sounds a little like the Erdogan of uh, the early 2000s when uh, Turkey had this economic miracle. Yeah, when it did have this economic miracle. But if you look at sort of how has been a, Turkey's economic performance since the 80s, in the 80s they were more or less on the same level as South Korea. And now South Korea has a GDP per capita that is about three times as high. And, and that's sort of the thing, apart from the politics and everything, you see this project, which was a big grand project, and you see Turkey playing this big foreign policy role, balancing different sides, having, a, having its own agenda. But behind that, there is actually an economy that is not really working. Uh, and it kind of reminds us of another country with an outsized geopolitical role and a weak economy, and that is Russia. And Iran. And Iran. And Iran. And Iran. Well, <laughs> I was actually in Turkey for, for the election, which we all thought uh, Erdogan would lose because of the economy. And this is fundamentally what I always say. What we in the affluent West don't get is that sometimes with extreme poverty, ideas matter more Absolutely. than the economy. Let, let's talk about that because uh, the, uh, uh, Erdogan has grown to embrace Ataturk. Uh, not the champion of the secular republic Brazil. the way that, uh, that was described there by Yosef. Uh, but in The Economist, uh, it's written, Mr. Erdogan has instead emphasized Ataturk as the Ghazi, the war hero who saved Turkey from the Greeks, the British, the French, and the Italians. Yes, uh, you know, I was at Ataturk's mausoleum uh, earlier this year, and uh, it, this is in Ankara, and everybody I interviewed in Ankara was, was in complete, uh, was in a state of despair because Erdogan had been re-elected. So let's not forget that it's an extremely split country. But, uh, but I could not help thinking that, you know, they started this republic on this hard secular model, which did not include any nod towards Islamists, and then Erdogan comes in power, and they have this hard identity uh, of what is a Turk, obviously not a Kurd. And I couldn't help thinking that, you know, it's been 100 years of really not being able to embrace diversity. You had the modernizer, which was a secular modernizer, looking to the West. You know, the, the Islamists who are voting for, for Erdogan now felt like an underclass, and, you know, and now they feel like their time has come. Uh, so they don't seem to be following the logic of the economy falling, etc. But Turkey has never learned to be a tolerant republic. 
Well, so the, you can f forget about the, we talked about the Byzantine Empire. That's recent history. Uh, just in time for the Christmas shopping season, out comes the 40th volume of The Adventures of Asterix the Gaul. The original writer and cartoonist are sadly long gone. But the best-selling series continues, keeping up with the times. The villain in this one, his name is Vis Virtus, uh, Julius Caesar's chief doctor. He promotes meditation and vegetarian <laughs> new ageism. It's the story of Vicevertus, who comes and upsets the balance of the village with his philosophy of positive thinking, self-betterment and all that. Uh, Joseph de Vecca, uh, uh, as a Swissman in, 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 in Paris, do you, do you get Asterix or why the French love Asterix so much? I get that, but I think the plot, I mean, I haven't read the book, but the sort of main villain is a guy who promotes positive thinking. And obviously there couldn't be a more French story than this because the French hate positive <laughs> thinking. They think if someone is optimist, he, there must be a ruse, there must be something bad behind it. Or an idiot. He's just or, or he's just an idiot. I mean, if we think about Voltaire Candide, you know, there it's this sort of naive optimist yeah. who's the idiot. Um, so I haven't read the thing, but it doesn't surprise me that the, the Frenchmen come up with such a theory. I find it a bit sad because as a Swiss man in Paris, I really try to resist the negativity because there's a lot of positive things in this country. Nonetheless. There's negativity in Paris, Marius Uh No, but you know, and this is something very personal. Not living in Paris, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to the world of Asterix, of course, everyone has a favorite. I prefer Obelix because he's fat, and I've been fat and a glutton all my life. So someone who eats wild boar, that really appeals to me. It has to be Asterix. He's powerful and he's funny. I like Impedimenta, the chef's wife. She's tiny, but she's got character. She might not seem like the boss, but she is really. Lila Jacinto, uh, is, uh, is Asterix something that you get? Yes, I mean, what is incredible about Asterix is how, is how well it is adapted and translated uh, into yes. different languages. So my favorite character... Including Hebrew. Exactly. So my favorite character is Dogmatics. I mean, what a brilliant name for a stubborn dog. Uh, but I think I like Get a Fix. Because, you know, I, I, I'm a word girl and I just... I can't get over how well these French uh, names have been adapted into English, and that's really the appeal of Astrid. Marius Schottner uh, rightly pointing out that uh uh, fighting the Romans can perhaps bring world peace. Asterix <laughs> has been translated into more than 100 languages, including English, German, Hebrew, as you yes. rightly pointed out, uh, as well as Arabic. Those who've read uh, the, the Laurels of Caesar will, will recognize uh, the cover here. And yes, Leela, and even into uh, Hindi. Uh, there you see uh, the, uh, the tour of Gaul of uh, Asterix and, 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 and Obelix. Uh, Rania Abu Zaid, uh, is it uh, the kind of week where you want to sit down in front of a good comic book? Look, I tell you, anything that uh, promotes mediation has to be a good thing, right? And meditation. <laughs> meditation, okay, so there, there's a point in favor. Marius Shatner, what do Israelis think of uh no, I, I personally, I, I don't, first of all, I don't know the Israel. What I know is that the book of uh, Guessini are very popular. I have grandchildren who are very religious. I am not, but they love, they love uh, Asterix. Uh, may I say something is, um, you know, in, in Israel and also in France, there was a lot of sceptical about meditation, yoga, peace on earth. <laughs> It's not so absurd when you look at it now. <laughs> it, it would not be so bad for people in the region a little bit to, to think uh, positively. With All a right. side of wild boar. Yes. We're trying to think positively at the conclusion of what's been a difficult week. Marius Schottner, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank Josef Devec, Lila Jacinto, uh, Rania Abu Zaid for being with us from Beirut. Thank you for being with us here in The World This Week.